This video was sponsored by Micro Center. Going in five, four, three, two, one. Send it! Send it! Yes! This is my level three rocket, aptly named Send It. Within the two major rocketry organizations in the US, there are three levels of certification you can get, level one, two, and three. I got my L1 in 2017, my L2 in 2019, and I tried to get my L3 in April of 2021. That rocket failed for a million different reasons, and after lots of improvements and preparation, I finally got my L3 last week with Send It. In this video, we're talking about the build process, and in the next video, we're talking about the launch process. The first step here is design which I did using OpenRocket and RAS Aero for simulation and Fusion 360 for CAD. OpenRocket and RAS Aero are excellent flight simulation softwares that can tell you how your rocket is going to fly with different motors, and Fusion 360 is how I designed all of the physical parts. The rocket is 98 millimeters in diameter and 1.9 meters tall. On the pad, it weighs about 14 kilograms, and it uses a CTI M1560 rocket motor to reach an apogee of about 3.7 kilometers. This is a big rocket, but it's not as big as my last level three attempt back in April of 2021 called Lumineer. I learned a lot of important lessons through building Lumineer, and one of the big ones is to keep your level three rockets simple. You don't need to push any boundaries. You don't need to do something crazy experimental. You just need to get the certification. The recovery system for Send It is a lot more simple than Lumineer, and it's called Dual Sep, Dual Deploy. For Lumineer, the only separation event on the rocket was getting the nose cone off, while we had a second deployment event for the main parachute, so that design would be known as Single Sep, Dual Deploy. For this rocket, with a Dual Sep, Dual Deploy design, we're separating twice, one to deploy the drogue chute and one to deploy the main chute, so we don't have to cut any lines, we don't have to sever any connections, we're just popping apart two parts of the rocket, and that results in a much more simple build. While the recovery system is a lot different than Lumineer, the fins are identical, and I mean actually the same exact fin can that flew on Lumineer. I stripped off the paint from Lumineer's fin can last fall in order to use them for a second L3 attempt. Since this rocket is only going to about Mach instead of Mach 1.7, I knew the fins would perform just fine on this flight. To recap, the fin can is made of a 98mm fiberglass tube, the fillets are made of Loctite high sol in a 1.2 inch radius, the base of the fins is quarter inch G10 fiberglass, and then I used seven layers of seven and a half ounce fiberglass cloth to lay them up tip to tip. This gives us a massively strong set of fins, but you do pay for it in weight because the entire fin can weighs about 2.4 kilograms. Both Send It and Lumineer are minimum diameter rockets, which means the airframe could not physically be smaller unless you made the airframe and motor case out of the same piece of material. That approach would be called sub-minimum, which is a ridiculous naming scheme, by the way, that you could go below a minimum diameter. Sub-minimum diameter should be called minimum diameter, and minimum diameter should be called something else. Regardless, in order to retain the motor inside of the rocket, we screw it into something called an aeropack, which has a 3 8 threaded rod to hold the motor case in. This ends up sandwiching the fin can between the rest of the airframe and the motor lip. After I cut the main body tube to length, I used the case and the fin can to mark the right location to mount the aeropack, then prepared the internal surface with sandpaper and acetone and epoxied the aeropack retainer in. For all of these operations, because we're working with fiberglass and epoxy, you'll notice I'm usually wearing a respirator and sometimes safety glasses for personal protection. Fiberglass works really well inside of rockets and really terribly inside of your lungs. At this point, I also put together the nose cone section. This is a four to one ratio Von Karman nose cone shape with an aluminum tip, and it's where the main parachute will be stored, along with a little ballast weight for stability on the vehicle. To give all of that stuff a little more space, the nose cone section gets a length of body tube attached to it with a coupler so that nothing is squished too much inside there. Finally, I started work on the AV avionics bay by cutting the coupler tube to length and attaching a section of outer airframe in the middle. The avionics bay in this rocket also serves as the coupling section between the booster and the nose cone, and it's where all of the flight electronics live. These electronics are a Telemetrum flight computer from Altus Metrum and an AVA flight computer from me. Each computer transmits telemetry on different frequencies, has GPS, has a barometer, has accelerometers, and can record data and fire parachutes. By design, the whole system is dual redundant which means that if at any point in flight, either computer decides to just take a nap, 
the other computer can complete the flight and land the vehicle safely. The avionics bay is terminated on either end by thick aluminum bulkheads that I machined on my Tormach 440 mil. Each of these bulkheads is more beefy than it needs to be, but the goal isn't to go for altitude or speed, it's to just get the L3 certification. Each bulkhead gets secured with four quarter inch steel threaded rods, and for a rocket this scale, Two threads would probably be sufficient, but again, we're not going for altitude, speed, or efficiency. We're just going for a rocket that is built like a tank. Each bulkhead also has a 3 8 steel U-bolt to attach chute lines to, and the rods transfer that load through the av bay to the opposite bulkhead so the load never travels through the rocket's flight computers. Sometimes PCBs can be structural as a treat, but let's... Let's not do that here. In addition, in order to light those pyrotechnic charges that are gonna be on either side of the avionics bay, we need electrical connectors on the outside of the avionics bay that pass through to the inside. I did this using Wego lever connectors epoxied on both sides, and these let me quickly swap out connections to different flight computers on the inside and to different pyrotechnic charges on the outside. More commonly, I've seen people use screw terminals for this type of thing, but I preferred the lever connectors because they don't require you to bring a screwdriver to the launch pad. Part of the goal with this rocket is to minimize the number of tools you need to actually build and fly it. The electrical connections between the inside and the outside of the bulkheads is sealed with hot glue, my favorite material on Earth. I don't care what anyone says, hot glue belongs on every flight vehicle. For lots of these epoxy operations, I sped up the curing process by leaving parts either outside or by a space heater. You do have to be a little careful with doing this to epoxy though, because you can over-cure it. I'm not sure if that's the right word, but if you cure the epoxy with too hot of a temperature, it can become extremely brittle and break more easily. And as always, I'm using my favorite epoxy here, which is Loctite 9340 High Sol. Absolutely delicious, great taste, excellent mouthfeel, 10 out of 10. Around this time, I also began painting the vehicle. Welcome back to Joey B Rocket Reviews. Today we're reviewing a bunch of shit. All right, quiet on the set. Quiet on the set, please. So we're gonna wipe down the nose cone section here, give it a bunch of acetone. What we're trying to remove here is the mold release. Some of these components, when you buy them from a warehouse or when you buy them from a rocket supplier, they have a bunch of mold release because they've been set up on a mold and the mold release literally prevents things from bonding to it. That's the whole goal, right? And so we're just trying to remove any type of layer of like dirt or mold release before we put some paint on it. So what we're gonna do these get painted mostly red, this gets painted white, this gets painted white, and this is all red. Let's go paint these things. Cut! Cut! Quiet on the set! Quiet on the set! For the paint, I wanted to go with a similar paint scheme to Lumineer, but in red. I painted the nose cone section white and the booster section with a base of red. I also painted the rail buttons in red and white to help them blend in once they got attached to the rocket. The fins got some fun racing stripes, and then I focused on the Send It logo. I was inspired by the Send It sticker that I saw on an Astra livestream a while back, which is derived from the Supreme logo. So I used that same font, printed out the text on two sheets of paper, joined them together, and cut out the text to make a stencil. To use that stencil, I used Scotch Super 77 spray adhesive on the back, and then gently applied it to the rocket, along with the BPS logo above the text. Spray painting stencils is kind of an art form and it requires a somewhat refined technique. And patience. Like, a lot of patience. The goal here is to go extremely slow and methodical while painting through the stencil so that no droplets can bleed past the paper and no droplets hit it from an off angle. So you actually want to paint a little bit further back as well. Even with lots of caution though, the stencils that I did didn't work perfectly. When I removed them, some paint had gotten under the surfaces and created some blurry lines. This happened on Lumineer 2 and I knew how to fix it, but it was kind of a bummer that I didn't get it quite right. Fixing it isn't too hard. I went back with a bunch of different blue tape and a lot of patience to clean up the spots that didn't get hit quite right. Something else that I learned through Lumineer is that you should aim to be done painting your rocket a solid week before the launch, especially if you're using a high gloss type of paint. While most spray paints will advertise that they dry within eight hours or 24 hours, even 48, if you're using a high gloss spray paint, it can take up to a few days or almost a week for that enamel layer to cure on top. Next up, I focused on the avionics bay. The lesson learned 
from Lumineer here is again, keep it simple and keep it clear. So with that in mind, the cables running to the main charge and the drogue charge are done in different colors. As well, everything also gets zip tied down more than you would ever think necessary, so there is no chance of wiggly wires under high G loads. Batteries for both computers were placed at the back of the avionics bay, as well as Ava's GPS antenna, and on the side I placed Ava's telemetry radio, which is a 900 megahertz XB Pro S3B. These are fantastic little radios to get started with, and they work really easily with Arduino. I have really enjoyed using them, but as we start to fly higher and faster with bigger rockets than this, we're going to have to switch to something else. The avionics bay also houses an up-looking and down-looking camera. These are run cam split fours, which record 1080p at 60 frames per second. They are fantastic little cameras. They are extremely lightweight and small, and I cut a small opening for them in the middle of the avionics bay with a Dremel and moved them around until they fit pretty well. These cameras got epoxied in place, and I intentionally used some relatively weak five-minute epoxy so they could be popped out later if I ever wanted to swap them out. As you'll see in the next video, this sort of worked against me once the rocket landed. Where I did not use weak epoxy was on this thing, that I call the power hatch. This idea was hatched, pun intended, in the week before we launched Lumineer. The basic idea is that in order to power the vehicle on, you simply insert a section of the airframe, no field tools required, and a lot less sketchy than a screw terminal which can back out in high vibration. The hatch is designed to be placed in the connector port and then heavily taped in place to eliminate the chance of it backing out. In addition, the two XT30 connectors that got used here get placed at a mild angle which makes it very hard for this hatch to naturally really back out. It is a little bit difficult to explain, but essentially because of the cant of the different connectors, because they are not quite at the right angle, it's really difficult to remove the hatch unless you are pulling extremely hard. <laughs> in order to build the hatch, first I CA glued the XT30 connectors in place in the avionics bay, and then I coated the bridge connectors in epoxy. I inserted those into the avionics bay connectors and placed the hatch over them. I let that cure for a while with a space heater before going back with a second coating of epoxy on both connectors to strengthen them. There are two problems with this setup as it stands. The first is that we could never actually fly the power hatch on a level level 3 certification flight because on a technicality it is against the rules. The rules for getting your level 3 state that your avionics must be fully dual redundant. They must not rely on each other. Because this one single piece, this one power hatch, contains the connectors for both AVA and Telemetrum, the argument that I was presented at the launch site is that that is not dual redundant and I would have to cut the power hatch in half in order to make it comply with the level 3 rules. I didn't do that, I just came up with two new connectors that were technically dual redundant, and we flew with that. And then on future flights, we can use the power hatch. The second flaw in this design is that the connector polarities should have been swapped. The avionics bay should really have the port connector polarity, with the hatch having the pin connector polarity, and this would slightly reduce the risk of an accidental power on of the avionics bay. With the power hatch and cameras done, I gave the avionics bay one more coat of paint to help the cameras blend in a little bit better. Overall, I'm really happy with how this avionics bay came out. It's a lot more simple and feels much more robust than Lumineer's mess of avionics and recovery. And speaking of recovery, let's talk about parachutes. The thing that killed Lumineer's flight was a ripped drogue parachute. And so to fix that, I purchased a few reinforced high-speed deployment drogue chutes, specifically built to not rip at high speeds. Using the winds that were predicted on that day and the desired opening load for the main parachute, I ended up flying two drogue parachutes. One was one foot in diameter and one was two foot in diameter. For the main parachute, I used the same one as Lumineer, but with a few repairs. During its descent, the main parachute got tangled up and torn in a few places, so using repair tape, I patched the few holes I could find. The chute is a 72-inch iris that gets bundled in a cute little Nomex fireproof burrito blanket to protect it against getting burned from the pyrotechnic charges. Now, in small model rockets, sections of the vehicle are usually fitted together by just friction fit between couplers and airframe. However, in larger high-powered rockets, this doesn't work so well. As you go higher and faster, you run into a real possibility that the shock, the vibration, the aero loading on the vehicle can separate parts of the vehicle when you don't want them to. That's why for a lot of larger vehicles we use something called shear pins. These little guys are made of nylon and they break with a predictable amount of force every single time. So they help us get reliable separation events. There's some pretty simple math that you can do to find out the right number and right placement of shear pins in the vehicle, but it's just as good at least at this scale to just guess and then check a few times with some deployment tests. For send it, I took a gut guess on three number two nylon 
on pins for the drogue section and the main section, and these worked pretty well in ejection testing. Speaking of pyro charges, I slightly oversized the amount of black powder that we needed to use in this vehicle, and I wanted to talk about how I made those explosive charges. In order to fabricate high efficiency explosive charges, here's what you do. I started by assembling a small container which could contain the pressure. Okay, the weirdest thing happened. Anytime I try to talk about how to build explosives on the internet, the footage just does that. Super weird. Probably best to not ask any questions about it. Let's just cut to the next usable clip. Once that's done, you can put the turbo encabulator into the boost section and you've got a fully assembled, high efficiency pyrotechnic explosive charge. I hope that all makes sense. In the next video, I'm gonna show you everything from deployment testing to motor integration to the launch preparation to the actual launch and then recovery process. But until then, it's time to hand it over to my good friend, Joe Barnard. I'm Joe Barnard and this video is sponsored by Micro Center. Micro Center is one of the greatest places on earth, and I've used parts from Micro Center in countless different projects, especially on tight deadlines when you need to replace a sensor on a Hyperloop pod or a microcontroller in a rocket, they've got you covered. Go for launch. Do you want to learn how to program an Arduino? Now you can. Do you want to learn how to work with Raspberry Pi? Now you can. Do you need help with anything else in Micro Center? Any one of their many associates in store can help you and point you in the right direction if you need some assistance. There's also a new customer exclusive where you can receive a free 250 gigabyte SSD with no purchase necessary by using the link in the description. And it's not just a store. If you want to share or talk about project ideas with others, you can join the online Micro Center community. So come on down to Micro Center for all of your electronics and otherwise needs. Thank you so much to Micro Center for sponsoring this video and thank you to you for watching. My name is Joe Barnard. May your skies be blue and your winds below. Thanks, Micro Center. Love you. I love Micro Center. <laughs>